Today's first story is one of the weirdest and most intriguing ones I've heard. It probably won't give you nightmares, but it will certainly get you thinking. So I'm asking you, once you hear that story, what do you think the explanation is? Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails. Thanks to the release of Dragonblood, our first audiobook, we've had almost 300 signups of new EerieCast Plus members. And the cool part is our next book, Westfall, is almost finished, which means the next members-only audiobook will be underway soon. If you want to listen to Drakenblood, read by Nature's Temper, sign up at eeriecast.com plus. Thank you so much to everyone who has signed up so far. Remember, if you want to hear your story of the unexplained and terrifying on this podcast, send it to me at darkstories.org. I'd really love to hear more Night Drive stories soon. Now, let's begin. The Drench From Mary Scully One Saturday night in February, my friends and I went to a party. We were five girls, but this story is mainly focused on four of us, and I'll refer to us as S, K, G, and myself, or M. We danced, drank, and had fun, and at the end of the night, we left in different Ubers. G and I left the party by ourselves in one car, whereas K and S left in another. G would be spending the night at my place. When we arrived at my house, I tried to be as quiet as possible, because my parents were asleep. I changed out of my clothes, tossing them on the floor, and G did the same, but she placed her socks inside her boots. This may sound silly, but these details will be important. We brushed our teeth and washed our faces and went to bed. The following day, we woke up, somewhat early, since G had some errands to run. I couldn't find my keys, then I remembered I left them in my jeans pocket. When I grabbed them, I noticed my jeans were totally drenched. So was my shirt, and G's clothes as well, even her socks. Hesitantly, I smelled them. They didn't smell like anything. Then I checked out my room for any leaks or rain or anything of the sort, but there was nothing. It was very odd, even more so the fact that G's socks were inside her boots, so how could they have gotten wet? What happened last night? You might be thinking we were sleepwalking, but no, if anyone had sleepwalked to do that, trust me, someone would have noticed. To have that amount of water in our clothes, they need to have been placed in the shower or something. And that, of course, would have left a trail of water. But the only wet things in that room were our articles of clothing. And there had been no rain, no leaks, no glasses of water, no sleepwalking. As G had to leave as soon as possible, and I didn't want my parents to know of the incident, as they'd probably blame it on alcohol or partying, we didn't talk about it much. I walked G to the door and she left. After that, I didn't tell anyone anything. I just washed my clothes and went on with my day. It was soon Monday. I kind of forgot about the whole thing. I had school, so my friend Kay picked me up. We lived in the same neighborhood. On our way to school, she told me, Something weird happened to S and I on Sunday morning. Curious, I listened to her story. As I said, K and S had left the party in a different Uber, along with K's brother and friends. When they arrived home, S was very drunk, so she blacked out on K's bed. Before going to sleep, K made sure to lock her bedroom door, something she does every single night. After that, she changed to her pajamas and went to sleep. The next day, S woke up first, only to find out she was wearing no pants just a towel wrapped around her, covering her from the waist down. So she stood up to grab her pants, which had been tossed on the floor. When she picked them up, guess what? They were drenched. Just like mine, just like G's. And soon we found out that Kay's clothes were drenched as well. Kay was scared, not because of the large amounts of water that lay on their fabrics, but for S's safety. Who had wrapped her in a towel, and why? What if someone entered their room at night? 
but she checked the door, and it was still locked. And, just as in our case, there were no water spills, no leaks, no rain, no accidents. As I said, we live in the same neighborhood, so any climate occurrences would be noticed by both parties. S doesn't know how she could get a towel. It was Kay's house, so S wouldn't know where the towels were even kept, and in any case, why would she even go grab one? Who sleeps in a towel for seemingly no reason? It makes no sense, even if she was drunk. S was confused, but not scared since nothing bad had happened to her. Now, imagine our confusion when I told Kay that same thing happened to G and I that night. Sure, if it was an isolated incident, I would not have given it much thought. I could have easily blamed it on alcohol somehow. Maybe just extreme humidity. Anything like that. But the exact same thing happening to the four of us in different houses. It just doesn't add up. Again, it did not rain that night. It didn't rain before that night. It didn't rain at the party. We had dry clothes when the four of us arrived home. We are not sleepwalkers, and Kay and I had basically sobered up by the time we arrived at our separate homes. So what happened? What do you think happened to us? Nothing similar has happened to us before or after. To this day, we still wonder what truly happened that night. It's a mystery that continues to perplex us, leaving us with more questions than answers. Never sleep with the closet door open. From Crystal Holly 22. This experience was encountered by my dad, and is the reason why I never accidentally fall asleep with my closet doors open. I was around eight years old, and my grandmother had recently passed away from breast cancer. After her passing, a few odd experiences occurred. My dad seemed to be there for most of them, but I guess that makes sense since he's a night owl. One night, he said while he was watching TV in the living room, he heard from my dead grandmother's room a metal clang, along with a click. Her electric wheelchair was in there, and she used it all the time to get around. But now, since she was gone, it just sat in there for the time being. My dad ignored the noises and continued to watch TV. But before long, he heard it again. The same metal clang and clicking. It sounded like the seat buckle was moving. Like someone was attempting to buckle themselves in. My dad thought this was weird, so he opened the door to the room and the noises suddenly stopped. After that, it never happened again. His second encounter, though, is the reason I'm terrified of closets, too scared to sleep with closet doors open. Once again, he was sitting in the living room, watching TV late one night. I always slept with my bedroom door open because I was scared of the dark. On that night, while he sat there watching TV, he kept seeing something in his peripheral vision, and it seemed to be coming from my room. He recalls looking in the direction where he thought he was seeing this thing, and he froze. Looking straight into my bedroom, where my closet door had been left open, he saw a glowing figure. And it wasn't just any figure. He said it looked like my grandmother, the one who had died a while back due to cancer. She had literally stepped out of my closet and began to approach the living room. Then she just vanished into thin air. I could not and did not want to believe what he told me. It was just too horrifying. But after telling this story to me, he insisted to me and my mother it was true, and it really was grandma. My mom said then, when people die, they can't just come back like that. It's not something God would allow, in her opinion. Rather, what he saw must have been a demon taking the form of our grandmother to seem approachable and harmless. This just terrified my young mind even more. Whether it was my dead grandmother or a demon, I have no idea, and I don't want to know. I just know that since then, I've never made such a mistake again. I always sleep with my closet door shut, and I recommend you do the same. 
you never know who may step out from it. Why did I go alone? From Sid Girl. From the age of nine all the way until adulthood, I've been drawing, designing, and drafting floor plans, something I could do for hours on end. Although young, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Several years ago, right after my first daughter was born, I decided the time had come for me to build one of my mini floor plans that were tucked away in the closet. I began my journey. I got online looking through different real estate companies to see what properties were available. Here in Utah, there are some spectacular mountain properties. This type of living was something I'd wanted for years, even though I was never an outdoorsy person. But I loved the idea of land, not sitting in a home where I could see the neighbor making her kids mac and cheese through her kitchen window. The thought of building and designing the exact home I wanted, developing something we could grow into, possibly having some horses, along with a magnificent barn, had been thoughts that would roll around in my head on a daily basis. These ideas and thoughts led me to online real estate companies that specialized in mountain land properties. One Saturday morning, I sat down at my computer and began to scroll. Suddenly, I blinked and almost yelled. I'd found it. I was home alone, so no one could hear or see how excited I was. I immediately called the real estate company and spoke with a man named Glenn. I told him which property I was interested in seeing. We scheduled a day and time to meet up at the mouth of Lambs Canyon, and that was that. Monday rolled around and I began to feel physically ill each time I'd think about the property for some reason. Tuesday arrived and I began having hot sweats. Every time the thought passed through my mind of meeting the realtor up there to check out the property, I would begin to sweat like mad. Wednesday came along, and the hot sweats had not gone away. By Thursday, one day away from the scheduled appointment, I was hearing a voice in my head that was telling me not to go without my husband. I recall thinking, I'm not going to sit around and wait for him to give me his approval. Finally, it was Friday. I got into my Jeep and turned it on. That feeling of dread, unease, and panic became overwhelming. I then realized I forgot to turn off the TV in the house and to get my purse. I ran back in, and as I passed through the living room, there was a talk show on. The folks on the TV were interviewing a 30-year-old retired veteran from the FBI. I stopped in my tracks. I listened from the center of the room, memorizing every word he said. It felt as if I was in the audience, listening intently, as if he were speaking directly to me. I took mental notes and proceeded to grab my purse and turn off the TV as I ran back to my Jeep. Driving east up Parley's Canyon, which is really I-80, I noticed that I was gripping the steering wheel with such intensity that my knuckles were turning white and my hands were all sweaty. That voice showed up again, this time even louder. I could be mistaken, but it sounded as if the voice was no longer in my head. It seemed now it was filling the entire jeep around me. The voice was male, strong, direct, and deliberate. It repeated itself. Do not go unless your husband can go with you. It chanted again and again until I reached the mouth of Lamb's Canyon. Once I arrived at the agreed-upon spot, everything went silent. I sat there for a good five minutes, waiting for the realtor, Glenn, with whom I'd scheduled the appointment. During the five-minute wait, I saw an old 1989 blue-rusted Geo had pulled up behind me. I moved the rearview mirror so I could get a better look at who was in the car. I saw this guy, probably in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, sitting in the car, not moving, staring straight ahead. He had light brown hair to his shoulders, with a long, bushy beard, and he was wearing square 70s-like glasses. He was wearing a heavy red plaid shirt. Strange, I thought. What in the world is he doing here? After those five minutes had come and gone, I decided to text Glenn, asking if he was still coming to show me the property. Glenn answered that he was there, 
he was the one in the blue car. He then asked me to come get into his car, and he would drive me up to the location. Then that voice came back, swirling around me, saying once again, do not go unless your husband is with you. I texted Glenn back, telling him I would drive up the canyon on my own, and we could meet at the top. He pulled out from behind me to take the lead. As I began to drive up the canyon behind him, I started trying to connect the dots. Why would a realtor be driving a beat-up and rusted-out car? Do realtors usually have unkept beards, and do they ever arrive looking like they've been out hunting for weeks? Sweat began to accumulate on my arm, dripping from my forehead too. The voice was chanting again as I was doing my best to ignore the numerous red flags that were invading my entire space. Lambs Canyon is a very secluded area. At the time, there were only three full-time residences up in that canyon. The road was only wide enough for one car, so if you happened to run into someone coming down while you were going up, it took a little maneuvering to pass one another. The night before, we'd had a snowstorm, and apparently, the road had only been plowed halfway up. During the drive, I noticed there was no one up here snowshoeing, and we appeared to be the first to drive the canyon that day. We arrived at the point in which the snowplow had stopped plowing. I stopped my jeep and parked it facing uphill. Error. I watched as he turned his car around to face downhill. I intently watched as he opened his door. I then saw he was wearing light brown heavy looking pants that appeared to be something a guy would wear hunting. He leaned against his car to change his boots into more winter hunting type of boots. Then he proceeded to change his red plaid shirt into a winter camo shirt and jacket. I instantly looked down at myself, realizing that I was still wearing my workout shorts and a t-shirt. I could tell that the snow was quite deep, according to how high it was hitting the trees. I noticed then there were no birds chirping, the wind had died down, and outside was complete silence. I yelled out my window, Hey, so where's the property? He yelled back, saying it was another mile and a half up the canyon. As he spoke, he began to walk in my direction. He approached my jeep as I frantically said, I'm not dressed to hike a mile and a half, so I don't think I can go on today. By then, he'd made it to my car, and he was reaching through the window to unlatch my door. I saw him looking at my legs, and he said to me, Clearly, you're in shape and athletic. Yes, you're gonna hike this canyon. He pulled me out as I watched him fumble around with items in his pockets. I saw an end of a rope peering out of his left-hand jacket pocket. Panic, like I'd never felt before, set in. I began looking around to get my bearings. To the left was a lot of very deep snow, nuzzled up against the side of the mountain. To the right was what I believed to be a very shallow creek, with snow piled up around and over it. My thoughts quickly moved to how easy it would be to hide a body up here. He took my arm and pushed me to start walking. If you recall, before going up the canyon, I'd stopped in my living room to listen to the talk show who had been interviewing a retired FBI agent. Well, I'll explain what the agent was saying. He was giving advice to women on how to save their lives and their children's lives when in danger. The mental notes started to flood my head. I quickly maneuvered to place myself two steps behind him and slightly to his side, as the agent had instructed. I recalled him noting that no predator wants to deal with a strong, confident, and calm-thinking person who makes direct eye contact with them, male or female. I pulled my shoulders back and picked up my chin. At that moment, the male voice entered my thoughts, whispering to me several times over, to tell this man that your husband is coming after all, and that maybe we should wait for him to do this another day. So that's what I told the man. Glenn abruptly and aggressively swung around and stopped directly in front of me. What? He said. You told me your husband wasn't going to make it today. Don't mess around with me. He was yelling now. He grabbed my arm and pushed me up in front of him again. 
I now found myself mentally searching for the agent's next words and the mental notes I'd just recently taken. I could feel my brain working overtime to find a solution for this huge problem I was in. I could hear my very soul reminding me my daughter needed me back home, so I had to do something. At that very moment, the voice entered my thoughts again. Ask him if he's still a photographer. Odd, but okay. I blurted out, Hey, are you still a photographer? He stopped, still facing uphill. He turned halfway around and looked over his square 70s-like glasses at me. He had one of the most terrifying expressions I'd ever seen on a person. He asked how I knew he was still a photographer. I quickly replied, You seem very artsy and accomplished. Simultaneously, that beautiful voice appeared again like a saving grace, telling me to say to him that I have a project with Pepsi and that they need a photographer still, that if he lets me go, I can get down the mountain to get service and get him the job. I did as I was instructed. As the man paused and thought, a sharp whisper came to me, Go now. In an instant, I stopped walking, turned around, and began to run back down the mountain. As I drew closer and closer to my jeep, I noticed he was pursuing me and picking up his pace. The man was probably around six feet tall and 220 pounds. He was fit and fast, and I could feel him closing in. I looked up and saw that my jeep was facing uphill. I almost panicked, but I stayed calm. I got myself back in the jeep. My bare legs are red from the snow hitting the mid of my thighs. I turned on the jeep as I saw him sprinting down the mountain towards me. I performed a two-point turn to get myself facing downhill just in time to see him in my rearview mirror. He went towards his car, yelling profanities. In the end, I made it back home and survived. I made a report with the police. I couldn't help but feel that was almost my last day on this earth. I'm truly grateful for that strange and small voice and those weird symptoms that tried to keep me from going alone. Maybe next time I should listen. Yellow Eyes from Zax When I was younger, I was taught how to hunt, and I instantly fell in love with it. By the age of 13, I had my own bow and knife, and I was a great shot. By the time deer season was coming around, my cousin and I were both excited for the upcoming hunting trip we'd planned to southern Illinois. When we arrived at the hunting lodge, we unpacked our belongings and began preparing for the next day's hunt. We were going to a deep part of the woods where the big bucks were caught on trail cameras. Super excited, we went to bed early that night. Early to rise in the morning, we grabbed our gear and headed out to the stands. My uncle dropped me off about 50 meters from the stand, wishing me luck, taking my cousin to their double stand. They would both be hunting about a mile or two away from me. The hunt was uneventful up until the last few minutes of light. Fearing to miss out on a chance to shoot a deer before dark, I shot at a doe a little out of my comfort range, but I was desperate. As I launched the arrow, it hit the deer and it ran off into the woods. I texted my cousin and uncle letting them know so they could come help me track it and pick it up. It was already well past dark, so we had our flashlights and we followed the trail of blood together, hopefully to find a deer at the end. Eventually, we came to a dead end where there was a big splash of blood and then nothing, no signs at all. My uncle decided to go get help from our other family members. He started back up the trail to meet them telling my cousin and I to wait here for them. As we sat in the dark at the last bit of blood, we began to hear footsteps crunching out there. Crunch, crunch. Something was definitely getting closer. Our hearts began to race. I felt the fear lift into my throat as I grabbed an arrow and knocked my bow as my cousin drew his knife at his hip. Together, we stared into the dark, Another crunch here, then there. It was getting closer every time we heard it. Finally, when we were sure this thing was close enough, my cousin turned his flashlight on in the direction of the noise. B 
before the light could completely reveal the creature. We spotted two yellow eyes reflecting the light, about seven feet off the ground. It then immersed itself back into darkness, knowing it had been caught. We both got a little closer to each other, scared, unable to speak, as we heard the crunch, crunch, crunching of the thing now circling us. We didn't know what it was. What kind of animal out here stood seven feet tall and followed the trail of blood? Thinking this thing was going to attack us, we got ready to fight. Then, up the hill, we heard voices and we saw lights as my uncle and two other family members, all carrying guns, came and found us shaking, terrified. They shrugged and asked where the last blood was. We told them we looked on for more, keeping an eye out for the dead deer too, but we found nothing. My cousin and I, still afraid, would not leave our uncle's side. Eventually giving up, we returned to the lodge, and we both decided we didn't want to go out hunting the next morning. Now, I've hunted since, and I still love the woods, but I'm always extra careful at night, and I always keep a firearm on me. I still don't know what it was, but I don't really care about finding out. Specter Broom from Whitechapel In those trenches, humanity unleashed an ancient evil. None remember, the survivors willfully forget. Maria Weber, 1919 Before I begin this story, I'll not give names of the survivors, as I'd prefer to keep everything anonymous. This is a story my great-great-grandmother told me, and had written in her journal. It was an event that shocked her and left her broken, as well as being one of three survivors of the event. Her government would expunge the event and give a cover story of what happened that day. Two companies worth of men would disappear, according to her, consumed by the land. After the war, she would be diagnosed with shell shock with moderate schizophrenia while being in a mental evaluation from 1922 to 1923. The year was 1917. My great-great-grandmother was part of the Red Cross, stationed at the German lines to tend to wounded soldiers. It was a standard morning where she would be replacing bandages, removing bedpans, performing surgeries, medicating soldiers that were damaged beyond repair to ease their passing. However, the abnormality of that morning was something else. There was a heavy, misty fog blanketing the woods the base was stationed in. It was warm, heavy, yet somehow chilled her to the bones. Her nerves told her something was wrong, but other than the warm, misty fog in October, it was normal. She was at a river bend where the trees just barely kissed the rocky river. She had traded duties with another nurse, in cleaning bandages that were soiled by men's blood, rather than having to work with the doctor performing amputations on mortally blasted soldiers. While she cleaned the bandages in the river, she listened for any enemy soldiers, as at the time, the English forces had been bold in pushing through the German lines. The last thing she wanted was to end up a prisoner of war. She did not want to have to leave her husband, who was going to be transferred to the same lines she was stationed at, However, as she was cleaning the rags and bandages, she felt a strange sensation. It sent a shiver that turned into a pillar of ice in the very core of her spine. It branched out all over her body, making her hair stand on end. Dropping the rags in her hand and standing up, her eyes darted to and fro as she scanned the tree line. She backed away, stumbling over rocks and into the tree line where she hid. Her heart dared to pound out of her chest, teeth chattering uncontrollably. She had no idea why this was happening to her. Her mind knew everything was okay, but her senses and body screamed otherwise. Thinking it was just her nerves, she took a long drink from her canteen she'd filled with cheap rum, which she had traded some rations for, then turned around, looking at the basket where the rags would be. Her eyes opened wide her hands quickly covering her mouth. She saw it, a massive creature in humanoid form. 
Its body was like it was part of the fog. It faded in and out, as if becoming one with the mist, then fading back into its own form. She estimated it was just shy of being around three meters or about ten feet tall. Its body was encased in a cloak that covered it from head to toe, or rather the ground, as it was not touching the ground, but sort of faded into the foggy mist. In one hand, the entity had the bucket of bloody bandages, with the face of the hood pressed firmly into them. Pulling its face from the basket, a long, dual-forked pair of tongues at least as long as her forearm licked at the soaked bandages. The area around the creature was hot, burning hot even, even though she was about two meters away from the thing. As she started to move away, she stepped on a branch, causing it to make a sharp, popping sound, echoing through the quiet woods. She looked back at the entity to see it standing before her now, looking down at her. She could see its face clearly. Its eyes were orbs of pure red light with cat-like slits for pupils. Its mouth was just an open hole with multiple rows of teeth, and its face looked skeletal, with skin pulled tight to the bone. Before she knew it, its hand grabbed her arm, placing the other over her mouth, pulling her up off the ground. She swore then that that entity grinned at her. Her body felt tired, burning like her bones were being cooked from the inside, yet somehow freezing at the same time. She screamed a muffled scream, then everything faded to black. When she opened her eyes again, she lay on the ground. Her gown was covered in a gray tar-like liquid that was cold and slick to the touch. Standing up shakily, she leaned against a nearby tree, examining where the creature had grabbed her arm. There were now three bumps in a triangular formation right below her thumb on her wrist on her right hand. Placing a finger on these bumps, a sharp pain shot through her body, that burning and freezing sensation coming again. She quickly pulled her hand away, panting. She was interrupted by the wailing cry of a man not too far from her location. Stumbling away from the tree holding her arm, she shakily moved as fast as her body would allow as she made her way to the sounds of that man. When she made it there, she stood in shock looking forward. The sounds led her to where she had been stationed. However, there was no one there, save for the charred bodies. Uniforms were somehow completely intact, not a single burn on them. The bodies, however, were different. The skin was burnt to ash, as well as pulled skin tight to the bones, as if every one of them had been sucked clean. Looking up, she saw the creature again. It was holding a soldier in its hand. The soldier fired their pistol frantically at the entity in the head and chest. However, the bullets just seemed to pass through the thing's body. She fell to her knees in horror, only able to watch what might happen next. The entity began to breathe in, a long, continuous inhale. As it did, the soldier's skin began to grow pale, his eyes bulging from his head. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. His body began to compress in on itself, as if he was being crushed. In a matter of seconds, the soldier was lifeless, his body hitting the ground. The entity peered over at her now, tilting its head to the side, giving her a light, airy hiss as its mouth formed a grin at her again. What happened next made her choose if she was to die or to live. The creature pointed its bony hand at her. She then heard a whisper in her ear, which said, Without giving a thought, her body moved on its own. She stood and bolted into the trenches to her left. She heard what she could only describe as laughter as she ran stumbling through the trench. Panic ruled her body and mind at this point. She passed over bodies that were just like those in the medical tent. She ran faster and faster, her lungs feeling as if they were about to burst. She could almost feel its hand on her cheek, its grip on her heart. Reaching the front line of the trench, she pulled herself up over the top. She stood breathing heavily, peering behind herself. She could see the eyes in the mist at the tree line. Without a thought, she ran into no man's land. She was crying out and stumbling as she ran. 
What broke her back to reality was a pain in her shoulder, her body falling back and landing in the mud. She placed a hand on her shoulder and saw blood. She just stared forward. After a very long while, she could only guess she'd been laying there in the mud for a few hours. All she heard was gunfire, the screams of men, explosions echoing in the distance. After some time, it all went quiet. She still did not move. Once it was starting to get dark, she began to move at last, getting to her knees. She looked around to see that the fog was still there. She stood up and walked back to the trench line, holding her shoulder. She then made her way to the officer's bunker. She entered, closing the door behind her to light a lantern. She crammed cloth into her wound and sat in the far corner of the bunker, next to the corpse of an officer. She sat in fetal position, with the lantern at her feet, and she stared down at a pistol in her hand. Looking over at the corpse, it began to let off a small steam-like smoke. What happened next pushed her deeper into shock, because the body began to decompose and decay before her very eyes, soon leaving nothing but dirt. She waited there for what felt like days. Eventually, there was a thudding at the bunker door. Nearly being driven mad, she took aim and opened fire at the door, screaming in the process, pulling the trigger on the gun even after the ammunition was spent. Her screams turned into weeping as she saw a soldier of one of the transferred units bust open the door, the blinding light of the sun outside shining into her eyes. She dropped the gun to the ground and cried, embracing the soldier. They did their best to comfort her. After that day, she would be removed from the front and sent back to her grandmother in Poznan while her wounds healed. She wouldn't speak for weeks, let alone eat for days at a time. However, when her husband was sent home to see her on leave from the front, she began to open up. By 1918, she was diagnosed with shell shock and honorably discharged from the military. Later on, she would be sent to aid in the influenza outbreak. After that outbreak, she would be diagnosed with schizophrenia. She would serve again during the Russo-Polish War. Later on, she would commit herself for mental evaluations from 1922 through 1923. She never really spoke of the events. Oftentimes, people would spread rumors that she had gone crazy and killed her own patients. She wouldn't really speak of this again until much later in life. I did some digging on the other two survivors from where she had been stationed. One of them disappeared seven miles from the area the event took place in November 1923. And unfortunately, the other survivor would end up a victim of the German camp Zuslaw in 1940. Say what you will about this event and story, but the region she was stationed in is still locked off from the public to this day. Nobody is allowed in. Demon pretending to be a skinwalker or a wendigo. From Country Mama 87. For safety purposes, I'll be changing our names and the names of certain locations. You can call me Bree. My husband is Cal, and my mother in law is Bon. We live in Anderson, South Carolina. When my husband and I got together a little over a year ago, he had his own place, and his house is surrounded by trees. On the weekends, my kids and I would stay at his house. We used it as a vacation spot, since he now lives with me. It's important to note that his mama's house, Bond's place, is right next door to his. The driveways even connect. When we first got together, Bon warned me not to let my kids to go into the wood line unsupervised. She began to explain that she was in her own yard one day when she saw a large, solid black cat run right in front of her and back into the woods. She described the thing as larger than a Labrador retriever, easily cougar-sized. I believed her story. Now, the Department of Natural Resources will not tell you this, but South Carolina does have mountain lions. I've caught a picture of one on my trail cam before. However, I'd never heard of a black one in South Carolina before. 
At the time, I was thinking maybe it was melanism, which is the opposite of albinism. The biggest cat species that DNR will admit exists here are bobcats. She said this was definitely a cat, though. One day, I asked my husband to take me deer hunting on the property behind his house. He was equally as bored as I was that day, so we left the kids with Bon and armed ourselves with his rifles. We walked down the trail that led us to the back corner of his property line. I slumped up against a tree while my husband sat on a log. Everything was normal, peaceful. After a while of not seeing any animals, not even a rabbit, we decided to walk on some more. Cal said to me, Hey, want to go see the old Indian burial ground located on the property? Right away I was intrigued and replied, Yeah, I'd love to. I should say now that I'm a Christian and I believe in demons. However, I never did believe in cryptids and the like. I absolutely love listening to scary stories and cryptid stories though. Those stories are the butter to my biscuits, so I was well versed on the habits of such mythical creatures individually. Well, Cal and I walked down the path to the middle of the back of his property. At this point, he turned to me and he said, Okay, we have to walk through the woods now. So I said, Okay, let's go, babe. I'm right behind you. I was so anxious to see this burial ground he had told me about. As we continued to walk, I asked him which tribes had lived here. Unfortunately, he said he had no clue. We walked about, I'd say, a football field in length through the woods until we finally came to a stop and he said, We're here. I looked around and I didn't see anything peculiar right off the bat. He then said, Look down. I listened and I then realized I was standing amongst quite a few flat rocks that were sporadically strewn amongst the forest floor in no particular pattern. Some were flat with the ground, others were pushed to the surface, like the earth had pushed them upwards over time. I almost shouted, Whoa, that's so cool, Cal. I didn't feel weird or anything like that while being there, and the woods were still making their usual sounds. He told me he was going to cross the fence to walk up the stream that was nearby, Funny or unfunny enough, that stream is called Devil Fork Creek. Thinking back on this now, that creek name gives me the creeps. Devil Fork Creek is a stream located just 7.3 miles from Homeland Park in Anderson County. My husband said the water was being blocked off from the stream, possibly done illegally by a neighbor, so he wanted to go check it out. He offered for me to cross the fence with him, but I declined. I have asthma and I needed some rest. He said he'd be right back, so he took off over the fence, then disappeared into the woods following the stream. I leaned my rifle against the tree and decided to keep looking at these gravestones. About five minutes in, I started to get this weird feeling. I knew this feeling well. I'd felt it before. My own house had felt like this a few years before meeting my husband, when I believed an evil spirit had decided to take up residence in my home, and I had to get my dad to pray in my home and anoint it. That luckily got rid of it. So I knew what I was dealing with here. It felt like a demon. The unexplainable gut-wrenching fear I felt in those woods matched the fear I once felt in my home. I didn't know what else to do, so I picked up my rifle and aimed it into the woods, keeping my finger a safe distance from the trigger, but still ready to pull. My skin tingled, my heart pounded. I tried to keep my cool. Suddenly, I heard a voice behind me calling my name. I spun around, but I didn't see a thing. My ears, however, were ringing slightly. The fear I felt was so thick, you could probably cut it with a knife. I heard my name called again, but it came from behind me this time, so I spun around, still seeing nothing. I contemplated leaving then, going back to the house without my husband in tow. Ultimately, I decided against this, because I had told him I'd stay put, and I did not want him to show up looking for me and getting worried. 
I heard my name called once again. It kept flipping back and forth, behind me, in front of me, behind me, then in front of me, seemingly in an endless loop. One sounded, I swear, like my husband's voice, but it was coming from the opposite direction he'd gone in the woods, and it sounded closer than he should be. I raised my rifle and shouted, Cal, Cal I'm right here. Right here. I then heard my husband call my name again, so I responded, I'm right here. I'm right here. I heard something call my name again. It came from behind me, but sounded distorted. This one sounded far away, though. I spun around, and I began to hear twigs snapping. I held up my gun towards the direction to see my husband walking towards me. I released a big sigh. I realized then I'd been holding my breath for quite a while. I dropped the rifle to my side, instantly relieved to see him. I asked him why he came out on the opposite end. He said, it's the craziest thing. I got lost. I don't know how because I was following the stream, and when I turned around to come back, I ended up here. I've lived here my whole life. I've never once gotten lost on my property. I was scared. I couldn't find you. I replied to him, Babe, I swear, I never left this spot. I was waiting for you. I got scared too. I heard my name being called, but in different directions. He shrugged it off and said, That's weird. The fear I'd felt before went away, and I never heard my name being called again. The woods went back to feeling peaceful and safe. We walked back home, and nothing was out of the ordinary. I actually didn't even tell him the full experience I had until months later. By then, like I thought... He didn't believe me, and thought I was just being paranoid. Only a day or two after my initial experience, Cal was in his garage alone at night, boogering around with tools as he likes to call it. I was inside the house cleaning the kitchen. Suddenly he came rushing through the front door. His face had lost a significant amount of color. I asked him, Cal, are you okay? Yeah, yeah Brie, I'm fine, just... Just got the heck scared out of me is all. I was walking back to the house from the garage, and I heard the most terrifying scream coming from the woods behind me. I've lived here my whole life, and I've never heard such a thing before. Not here. I asked, Do you think it was that big black cat your mama saw? Those big cats have the most awful screams, you know. That was no mountain lion, he said rather loudly. Okay, well, stay inside now. I don't want you going back out there after that. He wholeheartedly agreed with me to stay put indoors for the remainder of the night. A few nights that week, while lying in bed, I swear I heard something big walking on our roof, and I felt that same fear again. At the time, my husband was sleeping peacefully, and I didn't want to wake him up. After all, if it really was a demon there would have been nothing he could do about the situation. And if it were a mountain lion, I definitely didn't want him going outside to look and possibly get mauled to death. Let me get this straight. I'm a country girl that does not get spooked easily by outside noises. These noises, however, were accompanied by the feeling of pure dread. So I just lay there these several occasions until sleep finally took me. Just recently, I witnessed a shadow figure in the bedroom doorway. It was tall, taller than the doorway. I remember lying there in bed terrified. After a few seconds, it moved to the left out of sight and was gone. Right away, I rose from bed and shut the bedroom door. I've heard of the hat man before, but this being was not wearing a hat by the look of his silhouette but I couldn't really make out any features. At this point, after all these strange happenings, I believe what we might be dealing with on his property is a demon pretending to be a skinwalker. If anything else happens, I'll have to ask my dad to come pray over my husband's house as well. I think we can all agree it's never a good feeling to feel unsafe on your own property, much less feel unsafe in your own home from unknown forces. 
I hope it gets bored with us and moves along soon. I'm curious to know if anyone else has had these experiences, especially if you're close to this area, or if anyone knows which tribes may have lived here at one point and buried their loved ones here. The last thing I'll say is don't go into the woods of Anderson, South Carolina alone, because it might be the last thing you do. Shadow Island Drive from Evan's Fiancé In his 20s, my fiancé, Evan, used to like to go for aimless nighttime rides with his girlfriend at the time. One evening, they came across a strange sight, a row of houses on the side of a mountain that had each and every one of their lights off. It looked darker than a blackout, and it drew Evan's attention. He drove over to it, and there was a sign in an odd spot not facing the road. He angled his car to read it. It said, Shadow Island Drive. He parked right in front of the road and got out. He said there was a wall of darkness where the light just stopped dead in its tracks. Evan walked towards it, and that's when his girlfriend lost her mind, yelling at him. She screamed, Don't go in there! I'm serious! She threatened to drive away and leave him behind. She was so out of her mind in terror, Evan had never seen her like that before. To this day, he regrets not being able to go in there, to explore and find out what was happening. He's tried to go back, but he's never been able to find that road again. So apparently, there's a Shadow Island Drive in LA, but Evan knows that's not the location he was at that night. This was across town. Sometime years later, Evan was in his car with friends, and he recounted the tale. The friend that was driving got excited all of a sudden. He confessed, I've been there. I, I know that street. That same thing happened to me. He mentioned the strange backwards road sign before Evan could even bring it up. He went on to say, My girlfriend started to freak out when I tried to turn onto the road, so I didn't go. But I know exactly where it is. It's not far from here. Let me show you. After a while of driving, his friend's face went white. You see, he couldn't find the street. It was here. It was right here, I'm telling you. I, I know it was. He repeated over and over. I'd like to know if anyone else out there has had a similar experience, and if there's someone out there who explored the phantom pitch black known as Shadow Island Drive, so my fiancé can finally know what he and his friend would have stumbled upon if not for the strange and sudden panic of their girlfriends. Terror in the Chapel From Jack9053 I'm a Mormon, and at the time I lived in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge of Oregon. In the spring of 1996, I was the executive secretary for a Bishop A., since I worked nights, I would get my work done at the chapel the night before Sunday meetings. My wife C, my brother K, and I are very sensitive to things of a spiritual nature, except our dealings have always been positive. I knew the old building like the back of my hand, not turning on the lights except in whatever room I happened to be using. I would use the bishop's office to type out my reports and programs for Sunday meetings, the office and the media center with the copy machine were the only rooms I used lights in. The rest of the building I kept dark. I shut the lights off and closed and locked the door, preparing to leave the paperwork in the bishop's office for the following day. As I stood in the darkness of the hallway, I glanced up the hall to the outside door by the genealogy library. I then saw them, two figures taller than me. I am six foot five, they were standing by the door. They were shimmery yellow with green eyes. I fled in terror and locked myself in the bishop's office. It took about 15 minutes to calm down enough to think rationally. I knelt down and prayed that I would stop being such a scaredy cat. When I finished praying, I felt prompted to return and banish whatever I saw by the power of the priesthood. When I cast them out, 
I felt a tremendous rage as I turned and ran. In my head, I heard something say, If you marry C, I will destroy you. C lived two doors down from me, and being a night owl too, I burst through her door in hysterics. It took her an hour to calm me down so that I'd make sense. I told her about what happened. We had never even approached the subject of marriage, as we were just good friends. We decided right then we needed to get married as soon as possible. C said I needed to speak to the bishop first thing in the morning. When I returned home and got into bed about 5 a.m., the phone rang. It was my brother. He said he knew something bad had happened and wanted to know what it was. I relayed the previous events to him. Kay had been awakened knowing something bad had happened. He agreed I needed to speak with my bishop about what occurred. When I met with my bishop, he took the matter seriously as he had served his mission on the Navajo reservation. He immediately made an appointment for seeing myself with the stake president for that morning. The stake president agreed I had had an encounter with evil entities. The building was consecrated and therefore holy ground. He said the genealogy library was open to the public and people entered and exited through the side door. So it was possible an evil spirit might have hitched a ride with one of the patrons. The stake presidency gave C and I a blessing of protection, and they cast any evil spirits from the building. They said they agreed that C and I were doing the right thing by getting married, and we married in less than a month. And we'd end up spending 23 wonderful years together until C passed away. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at eeriecast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks, add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.